Spoiler alert for reality, everyone. Looks like the Supreme Court could be overturning Roe vs. Wade this summer. America just got themselves an early bootlegged version of this final decision before its official release date. Maybe they'll change the end due to audience reception, maybe not. No matter how you slice it though, the core conflict here is the same. Now it might all feel a bit esoteric, but for all of its nuance, this fight can be summed up by the t-shirt labels of pro-life and pro-choice. Now the debate today is regarding exactly how to deal with ambiguity in America's founding documents. You see, when the founding fathers were figuring out which rights to hand out, freedom of speech, guns, jury trials for conflicts over more than $20, yeah, they were sort of scratching the bottom of the barrel by the 7th amendment, the founders didn't write down literally every right that could have popped into their heads. A bunch of stuff, well, it just slipped through the cracks of their civil rights laundry list that they call the Bill of Rights. For example, marriage doesn't get mentioned once in the Constitution. Do you have a right to marry, or do states have the right to ban certain marriages, like interracial marriages? Similar questions revolve around questions of contraception, abortion, and as we'll see in a second, suicide. Yeah, not the funnest episode I've ever written. Now this leaked opinion, if it comes to fruition, represents a complete sea change about how a bunch of people on the courts are going to be thinking about these grey area implied rights. Put simply, it all comes down to burden of proof. See, up until a few years ago, if you wanted to make a law that was infringing on one of these hint of civil rights right, well, you had to justify your infringing law. With this new opinion, if you want to pass a law that's infringing on a potential right, well the other side has to go out and prove that that potential right is, in fact, a right. Now this sets up a landscape for revisiting every grey right area that wasn't specifically nailed down by the founding fathers or a subsequent constitutional amendment. With cases like Roe vs Wade, progressives successfully argued back in the day that the 14th amendment protected every American citizen's right to privacy. Now that is specifically their privacy to make their own decisions. It's an incredibly libertarian point of view that says, hey Uncle Sam, it's a free country over here, back off, I'm making choices that aren't hurting anyone. As long as you're not hurting anyone with these choices, should be good. Now of course if you believe that a fetus is someone, then you would argue, well you are hurting someone. Now that's exactly what Texas was arguing in the 1970s case of Roe vs Wade. In the end though, the court looked at the facts and found that there was no legal classification for fetuses in America's founding documents, and because of that, they ruled that you can't restrict the rights of a known entity to make choices in order to protect the rights of an unknown entity. It would be sort of like a state outlawing lawn mowing because they wanted to protect the lives of each individual blade of grass. It's my right to choose whether I mow my lawn or not, and if you're going to tell me not to do it, well you better give me a better reason than that. Now it's this whole idea of compelling interest that we're going to come back to later. And this brings us to today, and the conservative rebuttal to all of this. Now they come armed with their own test for determining whether something is a right or can be regulated. And to the 1997 case of Washington v Glucksburg, a case that is a lot less fun than its name would suggest. Now there was this doctor, Dr. Glucksburg, who had a few terminally ill patients. Now he wanted to help them through assisted suicide, but Washington state had a natural death act of 1979 that was standing in his way of doing that. So. You want to help your patients kill themselves, but the state won't let you. What do you do? You sue. The legal argument was that assisted suicide was protected under the liberty interest of the 14th amendment, and therefore states didn't have the right to impose blanket bans on suicides. So how did the Supreme Court even begin to approach this dark question? Well, enter the Glucksburg test. Now this test comprises of three unique steps. 
First, is that right guaranteed in the Constitution? Nope, the founders didn't explicitly grant people the right to end it all. That would have been really weird. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of death. Now, Second, tradition. If you didn't historically have this right, well then the courts are probably going to keep it that way. Bit of an odd second step, I'm sure African Americans would have a few thoughts on that method of evaluation, and in this case, it was found that America has a long, long history of banning suicides. So it wasn't one of these implicit rights that just sort of slipped through the legislative cracks. We all collectively kind of forgot to jot that one down, but well, we all thought it was a right, right? And finally, you got this catch all question of whether this gray area right is implicit to the concept of ordered liberty, such that neither liberty nor justice would exist if this right were sacrificed. Now, this one's a bit of a. Ooh, we, we have some cringy points in America's history, and glad we split with tradition a bit to create some new rights every now and then. Now, with this three pronged test, the spotlight was put on the legitimacy of the potential civil right rather than the infringing law. Now, the reason you would want to use this test as opposed to the other one they give as Roe vs. Wade, according to the people using this test, is an abundance of caution. To quote the 1997 decision that this week's decision relies on, we have always been reluctant to expand the concept of substantive due process because guideposts for responsible decision making in this uncharted area are scarce and open ended. By extending constitutional protection to an asserted right or liberty interest, we, to a great extent, place the matter outside of the arena of public debate and legislative action. We must, therefore, exercise the utmost care wherever we are asked to break new ground in this field. So with all that said and justified, this brings us to today's decision, where we're wheeling out this three step test a second time. First, is abortion in the constitution? No, everyone agrees on that. The constitution makes no explicit mention of abortion and no such right is implicit to the protection of any constitutional provision. Alright, so not off to a great start. Now to step two. Traditionally speaking, has abortion been an assumed right that people have just sort of forgotten to write down over the decades? For this, well, it depends on who you ask. This section went a bit off the rails. The conservative goal here was to focus the question as broadly as possible to catch every abortion restriction that was ever created. It's easy to point to different restrictions and say, there's an abortion restriction, there's an abortion restriction, oh, one over there too. See, we have a long, proud tradition of passing anti abortion laws in this country. Now, Alito just stuck a whole history textbook in the middle of this decision. It laid out the storied history of criminalizing abortion from the British common law, our founding fathers, to the 1960s. Now, the problem was, when you start focusing on a few of the details, well, things get weird. Turns out that most people talking about abortion back in the day had no idea what they were talking about. Hell, I'm surprised no lawmakers mentioned shooting down storks carrying babies. Now, this section included the famous citation that you've probably heard about to that judge who was sentencing witches to death back in the day. Turns out, not a big fan of abortions either. Now, progressives were pointing to the fact that most of the early abortion regulations seemed to fit rather nicely with the framework of Roe vs. Wade. It's not perfect, but let's play a quick game of spot the difference. You see, in the Roe decision, you have a trimester system where first trimester, states can't regulate abortion at all, second trimester, states can regulate abortions, but only if they're citing the compelling interest of protecting the woman's health, and finally, the third trimester, where you can just straight up ban abortions, go crazy with whatever law you want to pass, and cherry on top of it all, you can actually cite protecting the fetus's life as your primary motivation for passing that law. 
Colonial regulations were based on a quickening standard. Before the fetus started quickening, well, its rights were very ambiguous. Although when doctors can start detecting a fetus with their 18th century technology, you can no longer get an abortion. No x-rays or nothing though, so the line was basically drawn when a doctor feels comfortable assuming that's a bun in the oven and not a big lunch. Now this generally was about 16 to 25 weeks. Then in 1827 we saw the first of many pre-quickening abortion bans, but unfortunately for conservatives, the compelling interests that were cited were across the whole map. These procedures are dangerous. I'm passing this to protect women's health. These procedures are dangerous. Gotta pass them to protect women's health. They got eugenics. We need more waspy kids running around and can't have them all getting aborted. And of course, the man of the hour. Gotta protect that fetal life. Ban abortions at all stages. Now progressives were arguing for the second test that because regulating all stages of abortion first showed up somewhat late in the game, and even when it showed up, the motivations behind these laws were, to put it lightly, mixed, this does not represent the promised tradition of abortion regulation for the purposes of protecting a fetal life that would re be required for the second step. Now Alito, in his decision, countered this claim by saying, none of that other stuff really matters. An anti-abortion law is an anti-abortion law. The sheer fact that they were on the books regulating it back in the day shows that we didn't consider abortion to be a right. He specifically wrote, the right to abortion does not fall within this category. Under the latter part of the 20th century, such a right was entirely unknown in American law. Indeed, when the 14th Amendment was adopted, three quarters of the states made abortion a crime at all stages of pregnancy. So now to the final test. Is this right to an abortion implicit to the concept of ordered liberty? I think you can probably guess where this one's going. Now in answering this final question, Alito tried to differentiate this abortion decision from some of the other controversial decisions that some people are thinking's coming down the pipe. These are things like marriage rights and contraceptive rights. The difference that Alito laid out in his decision attacked at the core of Roe v. Wade's precedent, the legal ambiguity of a fetus's status. Now he doesn't outright provide a legal status for fetuses because, well, that's grasping at straws that just aren't there. But he does allege that they probably have some sort of rights if a state were willing to grant them those rights. Alito wrote in this leaked decision that the abortion right is also critically different from any other right that the court has held falls within the 14th Amendment's protection of liberty. Roe's defenders characterized the abortion right as similar to the rights recognized in past decisions involving matters such as intimate sexual relations, contraception, and marriage, but abortion is fundamentally different as both Roe and Casey acknowledged, because it destroys what these decisions called fetal life and what the law now before us described as unborn human beings. Now Alito's logic is that this wouldn't fall into the category of rights necessary for ordered liberty because in this case you can't throw up your hands and say not hurting anyone. There is an entity out there of unknown legal status that is being eliminated based on someone performing this action. Now because of this new interpretation, he's carved out a specific distinction between abortions and other gray area rights. Now this distinction has been criticized on two separate grounds. First, as we've mentioned a few times in this episode, fetuses don't currently have legal rights. Now to this Alito's answer was, well, clearly they have some sort of rights, at least more than nothing, so states should be able to restrict another person's private activities in order to protect those rights. He went as far as pointing to implicit acknowledgement of this in Roe vs Wade itself because of the fact that at some point fetuses had rights. Why? Well, under Roe, states could ban abortions in the third trimester, citing protecting fetal life. 
So they finally get right in the third trimester? That's what he was thinking too. The other criticism here comes from the simple fact that the limiting principle might not be as limiting as promised. Now he characterizes abortion as a special case that can be restrictive because allowing one person to pursue that act is injurious to another entity. Critics see all of sorts of hot button issues, most notably marriage rights, as something that, well, it's not explicitly written in the constitution, has a long tradition of being regulated by the states, and is arguably injurious to a separate entity. In those cases, it would be religious institutions at large. Now, this would be a pretty different set of arguments from the one before us today, but the door would be open if someone wanted to make them. So that leaves this Glucksberg test as the new guiding principle for these gray area civil rights cases. To quote Justice Kavanaugh during his confirmation hearing, I think all roads lead to the Glucksberg test. Thank you, and that's all I have to say about that. Now before I go to the outro, I just want to explain to some of my regular viewers why it looks like I'm in a hostage tape here. No, don't worry, you don't need to give money, although I do have a Patreon. No, I'm just uh, house sitting for my parents for a little bit and working from home. As I mentioned previously, my boss has gone on an extended vacation, so got a lot more work, but I'm still really, really trying to put out episodes as often as I can. Although this decision was released one week ago, so I got some catching up to do. I apologize for that. Thank you, and I'll keep working as hard as I can. Hello YouTube, I'd like to thank my patrons over here for helping me put out my videos. If you want to support independent, nonpartisan news looking into the overlooked, join this growing list of exceptional individuals by clicking on that link in the description. Also remember to like, subscribe, and do all that other fun YouTube stuff. And lastly, as always, thank you for watching.